thanks everybody for being here. Um, and uh, it is a great pleasure to have uh, Raquel Queiroz uh, today with us. Um, Raquel did her uh, PhD studies in the group of uh, Andreas Schneider in Stuttgart uh, and um, graduated in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And since then has been a, a postdoctoral researcher at the Weizmann Institute of Science. And um, uh, Raquel has worked uh, extensively on topological states of matter, topological insulators, topological superconductors, uh, topological semi-metals, fragile topological states, and also uh, higher order topological insulators, uh, which will be um, the topic of the seminar today. So um, Raquel, please go ahead. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks so much for, for the invitation to speak here. Um, I'm very much looking forward to also have some meetings afterwards if uh, we'd like to discuss. I'm going to tell you today about partial lattice defects in high order topological insulators, uh, which is a work that I've done together with these people here. So Cosmet, uh, AFW Dresden, uh, Nurit and uh, Jaime Weitzman and Jennifer Kanoestwetharan, that I should particularly acknowledge uh, Cosmet and Jennifer that we had this in very this close collaboration. So what I want to do, to do today is to really give you like an introduction to topology based on symmetry eigenvalues and introduce these new names like higher order topological insul uh, insulators that you might not be familiar with. Uh, and then afterwards, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, type, different types of defects um, that we uh, studied and uh, so maybe some directions towards classifying them. And I'm going to ask you, like, can you have any questions and anything is not clear, please interrupt me. Um, and uh, yeah, stop me whenever you want. So when I talk about uh, topological properties of matter, I generally uh, am describing some kind of like properties of electrons in crystalline matter and which dictate the character of these electrons. And generically, we're used to think about local symmetries such as charge conservation or spin conservation that really determine which type of carriers we have in a lattice. Um, but it turn, like, it's also very important to consider lat lattice symmetries, such as the translations, rotations, mirrors, and so on, to actually understand how, what are the tool constraints that I have in the wave functions that I can construct in this lattice. So uh, the, the simplest example is translations and translations. Um, of course, we know when we have a, a lattice which is periodic, then we have uh, block states which uh, let us define these electron bands. So generically in a material, I would have certain bands which are each state is labeled by uh, crystalline momentum. And these are connected sectors uh, in energy and momentum that we could in principle adiabatically connect these states by changing boundary conditions. So one thing that we can ask uh, is where are these electrons located on the lattice? Mm -hmm. And this is obviously not like an immediate question because we are talking about plane waves. Um, but one thing that we can do is say, okay, there's a few of these state, this, this bands field, and I can combine all of these states and construct local, wave, local basis functions in real space. And I, now I can ask where they are located. Of course, these local functions, which are called Vadmi functions, they can assume different shapes, mm -hmm. but two things are gauge independent and it's, they're all therefore well-defined, which is one, which lattice do they form with respect to the original ionic at lattice? So for example, those can be like, the electrons can be sitting exactly on top of the original ions in your lattice or um, and, or if they can be forming a different lattice altogether. And the second uh, point is which orbital is located at each of these sites. So what are, how do they transform under the local point group and uh, what is the spin character, what is the orbital character and so on. So the, the good thing about this is when we know these two pieces of information, we know completely how the entire collection of states transforms under this, uh, the symmetry group. So we know all of the information about symmetry in this, in, this, uh, in this case. 
And, it, and it means that it actually is trans, this band transforms under what is called a band representation, which was a concept introduced by Zach in the 80s and is now uh, kind of like being revived in the context of topological physics. So atomic bands are kind of like our building blocks of matter, uh, but and they are really characterized by the fact that with the states that I have in this band, I can form position eigenstates with a well-defined orbital character. And if we do think a little bit about it, it seems like an extreme locality condition to expect out of matter. So if we are going to put, um, you know, ions kind of like close together and each one of them has a few orbitals, so then we'll have a few of these atomic bands and they may overlap in energy. We really don't need to know anything about the, the, the details of the Hamiltonian, but we would expect that a bunch of these this, uh, this, uh, atomic bands mix together and the connected sectors that we end up having in the, in the actual material are constructed out of states that come from different atomic bands. And if I am not able to construct position eigenstates with a well-defined orbital character within this, with this sector, with the uh, states that are connected in energy and momentum, then what I have is a topological band. So when I say topological band, when I mean, uh, when, I, when, I, when I say that the band is topological, I'm really making a statement about locality. And I'm saying that there's some kind of like incompatibility between locality and band. Uh, and in particular, like if I am able to construct a state which also has a well-defined position, I cannot really tell you which band I'm taking that state from. And the other, vice versa, if I know which band I'm taking that state on, I cannot state from, I cannot like know which position mm -hmm. is located at. So when I live in kind of like, if I'm an electron living in the, the world of a topological band, I will not never be able to be completely localized inside of a unit cell. I need to kind of like spread a little bit uh, to neighboring unit cells. And that's what creates some kind of like entanglement, short range entanglement between unit cells, which is imposed by the symmetries of your, of your system. Um, so the claim to fame about this, these topological phases in these topological bands is that if you are to put some kind of boundary on this system, you're going to cut through these bonds of entanglement and you'll have bound states which are localized around in the sample. And these bound states are quite interesting because first of all, they're anomalous in the sense that they do not exist as lower dimensional systems on their own. So the, in this case, this 1D, it would be a 1D mode that does not exist as a 1D system. Um, and they are protected in the sense that they would not disappear unless I go ahead and mix the states again and make this topological band into an atomic band. So uh, actually it turns out that various materials uh, show this type of properties, but the, fa the famous examples and the uh, oldest examples are uh, mercury telluride, cadmium telluride in two dimensions, where uh, this was measured by Mollenkamp's group. And the, this, this is like quasi two dimensional system that has edge modes, a spin up going in one direction, spin down going in the other direction. That's a helical mode going around the sample. It makes this nice Dirac uh, dispersion. And in three dimensions, um, bismuth selenite, which has also a nice gap. And then on the surface, uh, you have nice like Dirac like uh, surface states. And this was measured uh, in the Hassan group. So, now, topological invariants uh, in general tend to be a little bit hard to, comp to compute, and particularly when you start considering crystalline symmetry as well. Uh, there's many different types of, of topological invariants that you can compute. It really goes beyond the, the initial ones like logical insulator or a churn insulator. So one thing that you can do that it's much easier, it's like a shortcut, is to use symmetry eigenvalues in order to understand a little bit about uh, the spatial profile of the, the, the distribution of, elect the, of the electrons, plus about their orbital character. So we can see actually the, the, the SSH chain is the simplest example to see how you can uh, take that information away 
from uh, Sinatriagon values alone. And this was a, this was a model uh, introduced by Sushifer and Egger to describe the uh, solid forms of polyacetylene. So it's just really like a, a one-dimensional chain uh, of electrons, uh, which is half filled. And uh, it has inversion symmetry. So we're going to use the inversion symmetry in order to find out about the, the, the states that live in this, in, this, uh, in, this, um, in this chain, the field states which are in this chain. So if we start with S orbitals, which is something that is even under inversion symmetry, uh, we can put, basically, we'll ha we will have an, uh, one, one Vanier function right on the inversion center, and that state will be left invariant under inversion, and it will, be it will have a positive eigenvalue. This will be something with periodic boundary conditions, so this means that also on the other side, I will have another state that it's inversion, uh, um, that is invariant under inversion uh, uh, symmetry, and it also is at S orbital because there's translation symmetry. So basically, I know that in such a chain, I have two, um, two states at least with a positive inversion eigenvalue. And then, um, uh, yes, there's a question? Yes, sir. What do you mean by the other side? Because you, I mean, you, you're making periodic boundary conditions. Yes. And mm -hmm. so, what's the other side of something? If I just, if it's just, if I, if I put boundary, periodic boundary conditions, I can create like a ring. You and if okay, I you're talking like a ring. Then I would have two inversion points. But of course, this, you know, I could have chosen another one and, and the argument would still stand, right? Because in the end, it's all related by translation. Every single inversion center is related by translation. Yes. So yes. you always have like a positive, so you will have two positive eigenvalue, two positive states with positive eigenvalue of inversion. And uh, everything else will come in pairs of plus and minus because they're mapping to each other in the inversion. So in, if you look in momentum space, that's like a, a cosine band, right? Where each state labeled at a K, which is not a high symmetry momentum, will be K, uh, coupled to another state at minus K. Okay. Uh, and there will be three, two, um, two states which are at K, which are which is invariant and the momentum zero and pi, which have a positive value. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so basically we've seen here like as an example that just by looking at the, the inversion eigenvalues at zero and pi, I can tell you that there's a, there's a value state on the inversion center. Um, but this is half filled, this is a metal, so we're actually these things dimerize and only half of them are filled. So this means that I fold my Brillouin zone and I have uh, two states now, two new states at the zone boundary, but those were not inversion eigen, uh, eigen those were not invariant in their inversion. So now I can open the gap, and depending on how I open this gap, I will have two distinct configurations. So if I have plus plus, I feel the plus state, I know I have the inversion center occupied. And if I do the opposite, actually I know that every single state comes into a plus and a minus pair. So I know that the value centers are located on the edges of the unit cell and not at invariance, uh, inversion center. Um, so the, the, there's a way of relating these two representations of inversion, which is this guy maps into itself. And if I were to relate it to this representation, and I look at uh, this, this guy here, if I take inversion, I go here, which means that I need to translate in order to get to leave it invariant. So the two representations are related by this e to the ik phase, which is that translation that actually justifies this minus sign at the zone boundary. So this is like the simplest example, and now you can construct from this, uh, you, can, you can find generically what are the, the various symmetry eigenvalues of all atomic bands. So in 3D, it is very similar. So if we have like an S orbital in the center of the unit cell, in a cubic unit cell, we have eight inversion symmetry, symmetry points, and we find that all of them are positive. So with these symmetry eigenvalues, I know I know exactly I know at all what do I expect in real space. And if I were to put that S orbital on the edge of the Brillouin zone, what I would get is this uh, uh, additional e to the ikx phase, which would let me swap all of these um, uh, k 
equal, kx equals pi eigenvalues. So with this configuration, we know now that we have an s orbital um, in, the, in the edge of the, the unit cell. So if you are now like going to look at a specific model or you do the FT calculation in a specific material and you compute this, this symmetry eigenvalues, then you can get various things. And if you get these, you know precisely that you get, you know, you know that this is an atomic band, but you can get other configurations. And it turns out that none of these are compatible with doing that choosing of a single um, position and an orbital. So this symmetry eigenvalues could never be achieved by choosing a position in an orbital, which means that they're topological just by definition. I guess I have a question. Yes. In the previous slide, mm -hmm. you could change the origin in real space to be to the edge and then it would be back at the center. I guess Absolutely. it's, so what determines that those two positions are different? So they are not, they, they are different with respect to which center of inversion you choose. Okay. So, so, so this means, so if, so actually this tells us that uh, changing four eigenvalues of inversion in one in one uh, k plane does not do anything physical to it, right? Is like it's uh, it's it's just a different choice of unit cell, okay. in different choice of, of of inversion. But when we do write a representation of inversion, we are we are specifying a center, and if so we change the center, we change the representation. So it's the local invariance uh, in the unit cell which change as you move across the unit cell. Sorry, right, the points, inversion points are not every point in the cell. Yeah. They're at different places. And you exactly. have to pick the ones that have the inversion exactly. symmetry. Usually there's a finite number of them. Like so so this would be this guy, this guy, that guy. Right. So so thank you. Would, there is origins. Thank you for the question. So uh, so this but this here no matter like we could not choose any uh, inversion center that would actually describe it. Um, and in this case, we know what this is because this is just the topological insulator, um, like bismuth selenite. Uh, we have a negative eigenvalue at the gamma point, which could have ca been caused by a band inversion around there. Um, but there's additional, additional possibilities, uh, such as this guy that has two minus eight, which means there's two bands uh, with with uh, which have negative parity in the gamma point, so there's two inversions, uh, and here the inversion is happening happening at different k points, and these two two scenarios actually they require this, the crystalline symmetry in order to guarantee it's topological. So if I were to let go of the crystalline symmetry, then I don't have topology in these two cases. So these are called crystalline topological insulators. So weak TI, you, you might be familiar with this, is, is, it's been basically around since the topological insulator itself, but the higher topological insulator is kind of like a new beast in the game. And uh, it's defined as some higher dimensional material, like a three dimensional material, that the boundary modes that it hosts are one dimensional. So they're, they're not like surface states, but now they're like one dimension lower or two dimensions lower if you if you want to make that exercise. So that was uh, first introdu introduced by uh, Titus Neupert and Frank Schindler in 2018. Um, and these are like two possible configurations of, uh, of scenarios where you have a, a hinge mode, a one dimensional helical mode that it's somehow distributed along, around the entire boundary of the system. So, uh, in, if we focus on inversion symmetry alone, which is actually the simplest case, and uh, it's, uh, it's very predominant in nature, um, the, the, in symmetry in, uh, the inversion symmetry indicator that we have is a Z4 indicator that, that was proposed in this paper here. And basically what it is, is to sum up all of the uh, sy inversion symmetry eigenvalues in the orbital zone, uh, and take it mod four and divide it by two. If I had, I need to say here, it would be divided by four if it was a, a spin for uh, representations. So this kappa now, if I, it's the parity of this guy 
uh, gives us the original 3D topological insulator uh, uh, indicator. So if it's like one or three, I know I have a strong topological insulator, but it actually captures a little bit more than that. It basically captures uh, the, the question, is there any inversion symmetric plane within the sample, which is a two dimensional topological insulator? And that's cup equals two. And that's actually like kind of like a, a, the other flip side of the coin of is there an inversion symmetric plane in momentum space, uh, which is a 2 DTI. Someone is drawing on the <laughs> Okay. Um, which is a 2 DTI. So, so this guy was introduced by Fun Kane, and basically, which would be, uh, you know, look here, for example, at that this plane, and then we know that this is a this is a two-dimensional logical insulator, and that would give us a weak index. So the total classification with inversion symmetry and with translation symmetry, what we have instead of being in C2, is actually a Z, a Z4 uh, times Z2, 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 uh, which is this kappa, which is the inversion symmetry indicator, and uh, the three weak indices. So let me make it a little bit more clear. What do we mean by, is there an inversion symmetric plane in real space that it's a two-dimensional topological insulator? And uh, so let's see if, if that's the case, we can actually construct it in real space um, by making some kind of layering structure. And so we start with a two-dimensional topological insulator in 2D with a spin up going one direction, spin down going in the other direction. and um, what we are going to do is just stack more of these on top and bottom related by inversion symmetry such that inversion is globally preserved. Um, so when we do that, nothing then forbids me from really gapping out all of these helical modes that are on the, around this, this uh, 2D, 2D topological insulators. Um, and the, because I know that what would gap that those, those helical modes would be something that break inver breaks inversion symmetry. Then uh, it means that if I, say if I open a, a mass of, so, so basically what we have here, right, we'll have like various 1D, I cannot, actually, okay, it's not, not, okay. I have like various 1D helical modes and I'm going to open a mass term with a, with a little mass term which breaks inversion symmetry. And I would expect if they preserve inversion symmetry globally on the other side of the sample, I would do that but with an opposite side because when I act with inversion symmetry on the mass, I'll change its sign because it's odd, uh, because it breaks inversion symmetry. And if I do that, I can gap all my surface except that plane. So that plane, because it's left invariant under inversion, it's going to remain. Um, and this basically, it, it's what it is. Bas we well, here we have a phase that has a, mo a boundary mode, which is this one helical mode, and it's protected by a point group symmetry-like inversion. And of course, it doesn't need to be exactly there. It can be in any place which would divide the, the sample into two inversion symmetric parts. So we could just move it around and generically we would uh, decide to go into the hinge of the system. Um, and we can in, in think about, for example, adding another topological insulator on top and another on bottom. And the only thing that we managed to do is to move that uh, hinge mode into the other hinge. So uh, the fact that we know that this is a bulk invariant, that this has a, this bulk topology, because that mode, that boundary mode that we have is completely removable uh, by any transformation that preserves inversion symmetry. So now the, there's a little bit of, uh, it, it can be a little bit confusing in the late, when you look at the literature of higher order topological insulator phases, because a general definition is as well um, a three dimensional system that has a one dimensional mode. So there's actually possibilities, different possibilities of, guarantee, of, of having those modes, even though it's not protected by the bulk symmetry. So for example, something which would have cap equals zero means that we would not have a bulk, it would not be protection, protected by the, the bulk inversion. Uh, 
so I can construct as well a, 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 a layered structure out of this. And every single 2D layer will now be, it will have a partner. So the inversion plane is not going to have anything. And in that case, then I could also gap out these states on the surface. I would put it in principle gap out the com completely the surface. Uh, but I may be able to leave in like a SSH chain kind of, uh, of structure. I, be, I may be able to leave one uh, 2DTI on top and on the bottom. And in that case, I have a situation where I have a one dimensional mode, but if it's symmetry protected, the symmetry that protects it, it's going to be the symmetry of the surface itself. Uh, so when we have such a situation, we actually call it a boundary obstructed higher order topological phase. So it's protected by the remaining symmetry at the boundary. Uh, so in this case, if we, break in, we can break inversion into C2, which is just the, the um, rotation at the a two dimensional uh, inversion and also to MZ and that would be enough to protect those uh, modes as well. And because it's hard to actually remove it, you need, to, even if you, if you break all of the symmetries, you would need to do some kind of like non-local thing to actually, to, to remove this state completely. And it's also possible that, that these states are just there by chance because you didn't complete the, the, your, your effort of removing these guys from the surface. And in that case, what you have is called an extrinsic higher order topological insulator. But in this case, there's no protection, no, no global protection for these states as well at all. So they're basically, it's a trivial state in, uh, if you look at the bulk Hamiltonian at the top. So the, the first non-material uh, to be a higher order topological insulator uh, is bismuth and it was uh, measured as well. And there's like a few different experiments that have seen uh, one dimensional helical modes in bismuth. And this was, uh, uh, this was a paper in 2018, it made to the, to the nice cover of Nature Physics. And so the, 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 the data that they have presented uh, here by the group of Ali Azdani is um, basically a, a well in the, the surface of bismuth and uh, they see some high intensity of density of states along one of these uh, this, uh, this, um, steps. And um, they, they see like this, and they are going to, to identify that as a hinge state. Uh, but I would say that this is a little bit of, this can be a little bit misleading because it's indeed a step, it's not a hinge. Um, but there's some really nice data actually coming from Orsay in the group of Sophie Guéron and uh, Hélène Bouchiard, where basically what they do is some, some Josephson junctions across bismuth. And when you have a Josephson junction that has a helical mode across it, you actually are going to have uh, the Josephson current to have like a sawtooth um, profile. And it's very nice because what they see is like two sawtooth profiles, which are um, kind of like on top of each other with different periods. And that would mean that they would enclose different areas and different fluxes. Uh, so that could, uh, what, what we interpreted is that like there's a, there's an inner hinge mode and an outer hinge mode and the two signals are coming from these two different loops. Um, and also in the uh, Heim Bidenkov's lab, uh, we basically saw uh, as, uh, the same is here, like a step edge uh, in, the, in the surface of bismuth that ends in the screw dislocation. And he could see very nicely that there's some, hen, some, some edge modes, uh, some helical modes located in that step. And it's actually quite nice. And there's a few more pictures uh, in, the, in the paper because there's like even a little impurity on the way and the, the helical mode just like kind of goes through it. It doesn't see it at all. And when it enter, when, when it gets to the screw dislocation, which is when the step edge ends, it doesn't scatter back. So you would be able to see that like by interference and uh, that that scattering would exist, but it doesn't. So it's a quite a good evidence of, uh, of 1D helical modes in the system. So, these kind of motivate us to understand not only what happens at hinges, 
in higher order TIs with what happens at step edges and other types of light, lattice dislocations, like screw dislocations. And so what we generically know is that uh, if you have a, uh, if you have a, a probe like the like Sophie Baron has, then it's kind of easy to to take into account the hinges. But if you have a spectroscopic probe, which is something local, you are unlikely to go into go and measure actually what's happening at the hinge. Uh, and it, what we're going to actually see is what happens as steps and what happens in screw dislocations and all, all, all kinds of other defects. Um, it's also possible. And this was something that was not considered before, that to have actually like stacking faults and grain boundaries that would also create uh, defects where you can localize uh, different kinds of topological modes. So what we asked ourselves is, do we expect to have I or the TIs to bind helical modes in these uh, different types of, of defects beyond inches? And what we know in three dimensions about defects, uh, about line defects that could host the helical modes, there's two types, there's, there's basically one type of defect and two, two, which has two, two colors, uh, which is these locations. And these locations, basically what they are, uh, is for example, imagine that you have a three dimensional sample and one of the, the 2D layers would just end. So you, or you can think about it like, open a 3D system and you just like bury in there another layer. So what would happen is that if you're far away from this defect, you don't see it because it's, uh, it's translation symmetry is, is, is uh, preserved everywhere. But if you go around it and you complete the full loop, you'll find yourself that it's like translated another, um, another uh, unit cell in one direction. And that would be the, the characterization of that defect. And that lattice translation is called the Burgers vector. So it can be a, a, an edge dislocation, which is if you have like an, an extra layer, or it can be a perpendicular, a translation which is per perpendicular, which, is, which would be called a screw dislocation, which basically would create a bit of a parking lot structure in your lattice. So that would be, oh, you open the 3D system, you shift it and you glue it back, and but you kind of like so 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 you created a, a, a screw structure. And uh, actually, from this paper here by Ran and Vishwana, we know that these locations like this in 3D they can gap helical modes, but only in weak topological insulators. Um, so it's actually easy to to see why that is. So in the, because it's a, it's a crystalline phase and it's protected by translation in this case. Um, so we can think about it in the same way as a layering structure of lower dimensional systems. So if we just would lower, uh, stack this, this, uh, these 2D layers, then, and I would try to get them, then translation would make, would swap my mass every single translation, it's actually, so it's, it would be impossible to gap them all together. So the mass would be zero on the side surfaces. So it, a weak TI is always characterized by a translation. And if you have a surface in, along that translation, the, ga the surface is gapped less. So there will be, uh, uh, the, this entire surface would have um, protected modes. And the, the surface which is, perpendicular to that translation would be gapped. Uh, and how do we understand that uh, uh, these step edges or the, the, this, this edge dislocations and screw dislocations have a mode is because we are basically, we are literally ending one of these layers. So the helical mode from that layer needs to go somewhere and it follows the, the, the end of that layer um, and in this case, if the, 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 the step dislocation is right on the top of the system and it ends, it needs to kind of like go down and creates this, this parking lot structure. It means that this would be an edge that would circulate all the way down to the other side of the system. And that's the only consistent thing that you can do uh, with helical modes that cannot be stopped. But, and there's a, there's a criteria that would tell you this, uh, it's like Randvish Panat criteria, to, that you, it would guarantee that you have this mode, which basically is B, which is the Burgers vector, 
dot m and at this m is the distance uh, of the the surface states in the momentum space but let me not dwell a little bit too much on that it's just given directly to the it's related directly to the weak indices um and this is kind of like an exclusivity condition so so it we really cannot expect the same to happen for higher order ti's um and we really need to have additional phase to justify any any kind of like domain wall that would bind this state here we need to have a phase that we gain under translation and therefore if we have a phase that it's protected by a point group symmetry like a higher order gi then we cannot have uh, this is locations, this is the location modes on higher order TIs. So that makes the, the data in bismuth actually quite uh, weird and, and hard to justify if we don't, if it's just a higher order TI, the, the STM data. So we said, okay, but let's do it anyway. Let's try to find blind defects that have helical modes. Uh, and we can just simply construct it and see if we have it and, and see if you can find examples. So we do this, let me show you some models and, and by that we construct them, um, construct them explicitly. We have 2D, 2D layers of topological insulator and we can choose those layers to be or, uh, stacked such that there's one which is at the inversion center or there's there's none at the inversion center. This is, of course, the exact same model. I just here just shows two different inversion centers that I'm going to decide to keep. Um, so in terms of, of symmetry eigenvalues, this is how it looks. Kappa equals two in this case. I told you that if I kappa equals two, then I have a state at the inversions, uh, um, a helical mode, which is left invariant in the inversion. Uh, and the bottom case is just swapping the inversion center from the from that layer to the in between layers so what we do is we we'll swap all of the symmetry eigenvalues on the top kz equals pi just exactly like we had seen in the ssh chain and that changes our kappa to zero uh, and this is now the two cases are weak topological in layer so if it's a weak topological in layer i know i have those nodes there so this is good uh, but I want to make it a high order TI alone. I don't want to have any weak, uh, weak indices. So weak topology, topology is protected by translation. So we kill translation. That's easy enough. What we're going to do is in basically uh, create a differentiation between every two layers, create an A and B sub lattice that then I break translation symmetry. Can, this can be a dimerization. Um, and they will, it means that I can gap out every two helical modes in pairs. In terms of the Brillouin zone, what I do is I fold, right? So this will be my new uh, uh, symmetry eigenvalues. And then I completely killed all the weak, in, weak indices. I only have a, a, a topological, uh, in high order topological insulator, which in this case is intrinsic. So it's protected by inversion symmetry. So now the thing is that if I had that defect over there, if I had that step edge, which ended in this screw dislocation, um, I see that I don't have a helical mode next door to gap it with. So all of these, could I could gap the entire surface, but that guy that is in the dislocation on the step edge, it's not going to have a partner to gap with. So what I created effectively when I did this dimerization is that I created an entire plane where the B sub lattice is misaligned and it's aligned with actually with the A sub lattice. So it's an entire plane which now has a physical presence where there's a misalignment in the unit cell. And the, when I go down the parking lot, instead of coming always back to the same, to to something related by translations, I actually go from A to B to B to A and so on. So that means that the, the Berger's vector that characterizes this, this, this location is now not a full lattice translation, but it's a partial lattice translation. And these defects exist in nature. So, so they're, they're, they're even common in nature. Um, so uh, basically what we have now is a line defect hosting a helical mode 
but it's actually characterized by a, bar, a partial burger spectrum. And by just, we can calculate it, this is the density of states inside of the gap. We see that we have this uh, fault here, which is surrounded by helical modes. So we, we can create all of these models and we see that this, this allow, and it's, if it's very easy to understand why this is, this is allowed. So in the, we can, the same thing can actually happen for, for boundary obstructed higher order TIs. It's just the, a different way of folding and different, keeping a different inversion center. So now in this case, when I fold, I have the, my bulk uh, symmetry eigenvalues are completely trivial. So I don't have capital zero. This is not symmetry indicated by any in, uh, uh, bulk invariance. It's only characterized by surface. The surface symmetry are only protected by the surface symmetry. But in the same way, uh, I can create these stacking faults that have helical modes around. Um, so what, what is the trick here? Why, why did we manage to kind of like evade the, the criteria is because the defect is not a 1D defect, it's the actual default. The stacking fault, two-dimensional stacking fault is the defect. Um, so in, in, com in complete generality, in the higher order TI, if I were to construct any line defect which is not attached to a two-dimensional defect, I would have no modes and that 1D defect. And that, uh, that to, to it, I would, I can only, glue, the, if I were to break a high order TI into two and glue it back, I could only glue it in a trivial way. But if I am a little bit smarter than that and I just glue it with, with, with a mismatch and uh, that breaks the symmetry, so in this case breaks the translation symmetry as we go across the fault, I can actually create a two-dimensional topological insulator there. Um, and there can be many situations where this would naturally occur. So this symmetry reduction really allows you to change the topological index of that plane. Um, so if we are to, to make a general statement about these types of defects in higher order TIs, we basically, by definition, we can always kind of move around this, this, this stacking fault and we can in particular push it all the way to the, to the, to the surface and to the hinge, which would mean that Every material that allows for topological faults are to some extent higher order topological insulator, but the type of topological insulator is de depends. So it can be either intrinsic, a boundary obstructed, or an extrinsic, meaning that it would be only locally stable. But the reverse cannot be made, and it can only be made in kind of like a special circumstances, which were the two special circumstances, the two, the two models that I showed you fall in these special circumstances, which is if this partial translation that characterizes the defect can be adiabatically promoted to a full translation. And that means that I could, for example, slowly turn off that differentiation between the green and the, and the pink sublattices here. And if I have, like in this case, I get to a weak TI which satisfies the, the red Bishwanath criteria. So now, uh, so this basically tells us that okay, there's actually it's this is from this from a, from a material science perspective, it's actually quite reasonable that we could have uh, these types of defects with 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 the topological modes, and this might be what what exactly what you need uh, for your devices. So the classification of defects needs to account also for that symmetry reduction. Um, and the way that you can start thinking about uh, um, classifying these types of defects in general, you need, to, you need to account precisely for that symmetry reduction. Um, because the, 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 the translation that characterizes the defect is a partial translation, not a full translation. It means it's not a symmetry of your system. And there's always going to be some dimerization term mass term, whatever it is in the Hamiltonian, that is going to be odd under it. So this is a bit technical, but, but, uh, but let me just quickly go through it just to, to expose the type of uh, 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 calculation that you could go about doing. And when you have any kind of um, uh, potential that changes sign, 
And that would be, for example, the dimerization. So we can think about this potential phi being something that is changing in space across the defect. And it has the asymptotical values of plus delta and minus delta because it would be the two different dimerizations into the two different of choices of unit self. Uh, in, and in the middle, we can think about it being linear just to simplify the calculation. The Hamiltonian, which describes this type of, of, uh, of, uh, of the bound states that would be bound to this type of uh, uh, potential, it's act they are actually given by the projector into the field state times this potential times the projector of this field state again. So basically what happens when you do calculate this, this Hamiltonian uh, of the, spe this, the spectrum of this defect, it, it, what it's going to create is out of the three-dimensional bands that you have around the defect, it will separate this, state, create bound states, which are bound in one direction. So they're like two-dimensional bands. And those two-dimensional bands are separated in space. So like, like a foliation of two-dimensional bands. And they are also separated in energy. And actually their energy and their position is correlated because you have a linear potential. And it would vary a little bit, this, this relationship between energy and position, depending on exactly which potential you would choose. So now, because this, each of these bands would be gapped, you could, in general, associate topological invariance to each of these bands. And this is something that we developed uh, in this paper uh, with, with Aslan Kalaf and Vladimir Vinovsar and Tolu use for the purpose of, of defining boundary obstructions. So, how do you think about this band, these defect bands? So if you have a linear potential that extends over some unit cells, uh, then basically what we're looking at is, the, is, is basically PZP. That will be our Hamiltonian. Uh, P, like Z is just the direction and that you're, that of the linear, the linear potential. And this is nothing but actually the, the projected position operator. And you might be familiar with, with the, 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 the concept of a Vanier spectrum, which is the spectrum of the projected position operator. So, but it's the spectrum of the projected position operator inside of one unit cell. So the, the, defect, the defect Hamiltonian is nothing, it's going to be just the repetition of the Vanier spectrum by how many unit cells as it, your, your um, uh, potential extends over. And you can actually symmetry characterize the Vanier spectrum by doing what? By picking up the representation of the bulk and restricting it to the symmetry of the defect. Uh, and when you do that, basically what you get is like something that it's reducible because the, it separates in, in, in bands. For example, in the case that I uh, showed you of the dimerized weak TI, it's just two Vanier bands. And these can have like a, a representation in the bulk, which is either not compatible, which is topological, not compatible with an atomic insulator, or topological. But then the restrictions, which are, of course, for a lower dimensional Brillouin zone, because now you have only 2D bands, um, can be topological in general. So you, this, this type of reduction, there's just a prescription that you can do, uh, which is just picking out certain entries of this representation, and you can find that can be topological. So, but the, the, let me just go back a little bit to, to the experimental relevance of this, and why do we do we think about why do we think that this is particular? This is relevant, is that there's actually quite a few materials um, that have um, that have like almost translations on there on them, which are not quite translations, and that can happen by all kinds of like. Uh, Jan Teller type of, of, of mechanisms, of, uh, just distortions of the lattice. So in, in, in situations where you have that, then there's a, a natural connection between this little b and the, a b, an, act, a, an actual translation, and it's a natural uh, point to create stacking faults. So when you have something which is almost a translation, but not quite, then it can actually happen naturally that you have a bunch of these stacking faults cre being created. So examples of this is uh, um, and the, the transition metal dichalcogenides, like molybdenum mobili te tellurite and tungsten ditellurite. And what they have, you can see here that the unit cell, you, ha you have like very, it's a layered material. 
and they're very similar layers. So they're just related by a little, by a little mirror. Uh, and each layer of them independently is actually a 2 DTI, and this, uh, this has been some nice uh, uh, experiments by Pablo Giroajero in MIT. So actually in this material, it would be very natural to expect to see partial de line defects with helical modes on them. Also bismuth, it forms a bilayer structure uh, and each, bi each bilayer is a 2 DTI in this case. So it's a little bit different, but it's, it has, it's also, it's very, very close from being as in a, in a, in a, for being deformed into, uh, into not forming bilayers. And therefore also there's like a lot of uh, stacking faults that appear in this, in this, in this structure. And this is a different uh, material, which is, uh, which is also, supposed to, to, to create these stacking faults. And, uh, and uh, b this is basically, it's, it's, it's a 2 DTI with, uh, with some spacers that vary in size. So actually, uh, this guy is quite literally the model that we've constructed. So it's like just a, um, a dimerized quick TI with 2D layers, which are coupled with different coupling strengths. Um, so, this would be seen in STM, for example. So, so here, uh, it actually it looks like it has been seen in, in STM already, uh, in believed in ditelluride. So here, as as I said, the, the layers are extremely similar. So it's natural to have a single step of a single monolayer, uh, and this is exactly what they see. Um, and this is some excess of density states that that uh, could be this helical mode. Now they claim also that it's a helical mode, but we can think about other things, right? So other other ways of utilizing these types of defects, which are topological in materials, to change their bulk properties. So if you are going to mechanically induce the stacking faults to 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 be created inside of a, outside of a material, you could create this network of one-dimensional modes, electronic modes that would enhance the, the bulk conductivity of a system. And what you would do also at the same time, because you're putting on all these like uh, grain boundaries and stacking faults inside, you're actually going to scatter off a bunch of the, um, um, the, the, the photons. So it would actually decrease the thermal conductivity in the system as well. And you would expect to have an increase of the ZT factor uh, the figure of merit of, for a thermoelectricity because this actually depends on the ratio between the electric conductivity and the thermal conductivity. And this has actually been done in, uh, in bismuth and antimony alloys where you can see there's a very large increase of, of, uh, of, uh, of the ZT depending on how many uh, these locations you include in the system. So, okay, so let me before I conclude, just uh, just kind of like advertise here another uh, thing that you can do with helical modes on defects, because the, the nice thing about this is that you have really have like a three-dimensional system that has helical modes and which which are like on that surface, right? So it's not on the edge of a two-dimensional device that it's hard to access. So if it's on the, if it's in, right inside of like a three-dimensional system, and on the surface of a three-dimensional system, you can start playing with it a little bit. And you, one thing that you can do is to put a super, to put a superconductor at top. You can put a ferromagnet, a ferromagnet. You can put a plyomagnetic field, and you can start creating these types of devices. So if you were to put actually superconductivity on top, uh, you could because the 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 the, the energy scale that that localizes the 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 helical mode is not the spin orbit coupling but it's the mass uh, of the symmetry breaking on the surface you could actually split that helical fermion into helical majoranas um, you could put like a ferromagnetic island and you can create majorana zero modes and actually this was uh, done uh, by by Bertoliek in the alias Danis group uh, it's, it's, which is a very nice, uh, really cool experiment. And you could, in principle, uh, in addition, you can put a magnetic field and you could split that helical fermion into chiral Majorana fermions, and you could do all that type of like uh, um, 
play and creates different types of interferon and interferometer devices. So basically, this is this is how I, how, where I end. Um, there's more topological defects than expected, and there's looking for symmetry breaking defects is actually a rich place to look to look for topology. And there's a there's a, a natural material science realization of them. So so there's there's a, a reason to look for them, and these defects can enhance the topological response of materials. Uh, so they're they're actually quite interesting, and there is still a class a full classification of them needs to be completed. And with that, let me thank my collaborators uh, on the various topics, per particularly the stacking faults, uh, these people that I've talked about. And with that, let me thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Raquel, for this uh, great, great presentation. Um, do we have any questions? I have a quick question. Um, so, so Raquel, you showed us uh, this uh, special uh, states uh, that are localized on defects. Uh, would you say these are hallmarks of higher order topological states? I can't get them in a strong 3D TI. No, so in a strong T so in a strong 2D TI, uh, I don't think there would be a, a defect. From so basically, what you would have. In a strong 2DTI, you have a, the surface is gapless, right? So we need to have it gapped. So that's why this is the this is uh, this is good in weak top uh, or topological insulators do them. So the the stacking fault we want the stacking fault to be gapped to have that helpful mode. So if if I actually and I, I showed you this this kind of like cartoonish, but I think it's uh, but it, but I think it's kind of like interesting to see. I can think about this fault as the surface. It's just, I can put it the fault on the surface. So if I want to have a surface being a 2DTI, which is gapped, and I want the fault as well to have this be a 2DTI and it's gapped, I need to have a higher order TI. Otherwise, this the fault, the entire fault would be metallic, which can also be interesting, right? So it could, it could be interesting to have like a buried metal inside of an insulator. Yeah, but, um, so, so that's what I was uh, trying to get at. Like, can you actually create a surface inside the bulk in the three? Uh, so, so I, I, I think so. I, I think so. we didn't we didn't explore it completely. Uh, but so if we have okay, but but actually the, the answer is is relatively simple. So basically, if we would have uh, this is the modulation of a boundary, right? You can always think about making a boundary that way. If it's a topological insulator with a strong topological index, then the Wilson spectrum would wind. So this spectrum would be gapless. It would be metal. Mm -hmm. And you would need um, a crystalline symmetry uh, protected topological insulator? No, I don't think so. No, it doesn't have to be. So, so the, 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 actually the the... the the key ingredient here is to have something which is almost a translation in order to create the stacking fault. Mm -hmm. uh, the actual symmetry protection, it's not so rel it's, but it, you're going to break a bunch of symmetries anyway locally, so it's not so important. Uh, we, we, this is all about st local stability in the end because of this because this, the, the fault breaks all the symmetries. So we can use symmetry in order to like quickly tell whether you are going to have a 2 DTI or not, but um, but it's it wouldn't be necessary. Like right, it's, it's it in the end a, a helical mode is protected by time reversal symmetry alone. Otherwise, you won't get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question uh, until. Uh, you know, somebody else uh, decides to ask their questions. Um, so I was looking at the, um, the experiments from, uh, from Princeton um, with that sort of uh, well in the middle of the, the surface of the sample. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking that these, this, that looks nice and, and, and almost symmetric, but uh, in general, these defects might have um, a very complicated structure. And um, my question is, is it, are the hinge modes 
always uniquely defined? I mean, their location, where in which hinges they will appear, is that always completely defined by symmetry or is there any cases where there can be ambiguity and degeneracy? Okay, so 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 that, let me break that into a few pieces. I don't think in this that this is a hinge, and um, in this in this case, I think this is a step edge, and I therefore I don't expect to have a helical mode. So I don't agree with this picture that the, it, they will dive into into disappearance here and will connect in this particular fashion. Mm -hmm. the, the what we would expect out of the step. Uh, edge in a high order TI is the mass here is equal to this mass here because it's the same normal to the surface and therefore it will gap it will close in here so this guy uh, is not necessarily a helical mode that is so, so you would you would want this to penetrate all the way through the sample for, for so this the, a hinge mode needs to be it's a hinge mode and this this basically a hinge mode is something that exists on the domain wall between two regions of opposite mass, which are related by inversion symmetry or by whatever symmetry is this, that it's protecting. So that means the hinge mode cannot be removed because the mass on this side is going to be opposite to the mass here. And this mass depends on the normal to the surface. So that because it depends on the normal to the surface, because in general, it's kind of like a projection of both parameters into the surface. What would generically happen is that this appears at hinges. Uh, because, um, yeah, the, right, because it's locally, I will know the mass and I will just know the normal to the surface. But sorry, so the, how do you define the hinge? Like, why is a hinge different than a step? Um, I guess that's so, what I'm missing. Right, so so the mass here is uh, depends on the normal to the surface. So the normal is facing up and it can have a sign. And on this side, the normal is facing sideways. So it can have a different sign because this mass in the end comes out of like uh, internal bulk parameters which are projected to the, to the boundary. So if I would think about a step, okay, so let me see if I can write. Okay, good. So if I think about a step, then the normal here equals to the normal here, right? So if I either have two modes, which are, uh, you know, because this guy here, which is very small, it's going to be an opposite sign, or I don't have any. So the, the localization of these two guys would need to somehow be smaller than the one unit cell. So, so that doesn't really happen. And, and the reason, the only way to like make sure I don't have two and I only have one is that this side, side here is not a full cool lattice translation, but only half or some kind of like partial one. So in that sense, uh, so you, so yeah, you could, you can, you can change these things and it will always be on the hinge, uh, but you can change the parameters and it will change where it actually is. That depends on microscopics. Okay, but it will always be, um, it will always be one or the other, right? It will, it will never be, uh, it will never be any ambiguity. If you um, use the microscopic no, I mean, parameters, uh, it will be uh, what you're showing on this slide, or versus what, or what versus the other side. So, so okay. So one thing that you can do is so so bismuth has um, this bilayer structure. So if you would terminate, and let me find the the, the structure of bismuth it was here somewhere. Okay, if you in, it naturally terminates in a full bilayer, but if you were to terminate the surface on a half and half right? Like then you would have a different surface termination, different mass, microscopic ma mass terms on the surface, and you could change the mass in principle on the surface. And then you could change which hinge has it. But the, 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 the actual the specific mass, it's determined by the material properties alone. So like, okay, gotcha. Thanks. Okay, I don't see other questions, so I will ask another one. Um, so uh, you um, you gave a really nice uh, introduction to topological insulation in the beginning, and I was wondering if you could also tell us whether and if so, how fragile topology fits into the picture. Um, okay, cool. I like that. <laughs> so so 
let's let's go to the cartoon. I have this cartoon over here. So basically, what what uh, we have when we put have far, fragile topology is that we are able to add some additional bands to it and reshuffle the degrees of freedom such that I have an atomic insulator. So let me maybe here. So I could have a situation that I have a bunch of states and with those states, I cannot construct an atomic in a, a position eigenstates, right? And this just makes it topological. But then I bring one guy, which is an atomic insulator and I mix those states. And now if I just change the basis, I can find it to be an atomic insulator in a different position. Does that make sense? So, so it's possible that here I have something that, you know, like I cannot really put this, this body states anywhere. So they're like shared between these three unit cells, but then I bring another, uh, another atomic state and I say that I put it right here inside in the, it's in the triangular lattice. This is just another band. I add this another band. And now I mix these two, these two Vanier states and I can construct two new Vanier states which are completely well, like delta function localized. So let's say that now, okay, it would be nice to have like different colors. Ah, I do have different colors. So let's say that this is actually unitarily equivalent so this guy plus this guy is unitary equivalent to have a lattice like this. So like this guy plus this guy in the center equals two, which are separated like that. That, that would be what happens with the fragile band. Gotcha. So you could just complete a basis essentially, and the yeah. new or the bands that you need to complete the basis might be somewhere else in energy. So, if you, I guess, if you look at a certain energy window only, that's when you see something that uh, right. is topological. But if you take the whole thing together, uh, you can trivialize it. You can localize. Uh, exactly. Okay. So what, the way that 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 we calculate these things is by looking at the Wilson spectrum. And uh, so you can see like a winding of the Wilson spectrum means that you cannot localize it. But if you are now compute the Wilson spectrum with an, the other band, it, in addition, you're going to see that it gaps. And, yeah. can, and, you, and you can localize. Cool, thanks. Um, uh, any other questions? So I, I just wanna, just one little thing. So not every, uh, mix, mixing of states is giving you a topological states, right? I mean, we know of many, uh, many examples where you have bands that are not one uh, orbital or another. So you have to have some odd number of, of uh, band uh, inversions and stuff like that. Um, no, so if you can, so the, the, the basically the question is, uh, can you write a local basis or not, right? With you, you, you pick up something that it's an atomic band and you cut it in half, let's say, or you bring two together, mix them and then cut it in half. And you ask, do I have a local basis for this or not? Generically, you don't because, because you know, imagine graphene, right? So in graphene, you have P orbitals, which are located in the hexagonal lattice. If you cut half of that, the only place where you can put a, a state is like in a, making a triangular lattice. So you can basically put, make a triangular lattice with an S orbital or with a P orbital or whatever. Like, and you are going, this is the only two D, uh, one dimensional representations you have. So you, you're going to compare that with half of graphene and it's not going to match, right? So that's like how you immediately see that graphene is completely, it's like, as topological as it can, basically, if you feel it all the way to the to the to the Dirac point, and um, and you can see that also by looking at at the expected position as you change momentum, right? So if you are before the K point, they look there. It's it's kind of like like this the Wilson spectrum. So it's at zero, and then it's at the middle of the unit cell, and then it's at zero again, like as you cross the K point. So you, so you, there's no consistent choice of position for all the field states in graphene. 
And that is just because you chopped one of the, one atomic orbital in half. And uh, and it it just happens very commonly. So 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 in Right, it can be just by band inversion, but it can also be just by 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 chopping bands in half. Like if you fold, you can chop bands in half and, and stuff like that. So, okay, thanks. That's helpful. It's, it's actually it's actually rare that it, that you know to to get if you account for all of the symmetries and you need to you need to say okay this is the field states are going to be an atomic insulator and they need they need to transform correctly and there's some atomic phases. It's it's going to be kind of rare to find it. You know, it's just the type of topology might be a little bit obscure, and you don't see it immediately. But um, Andrea Marie, yes, uh, thank you very much for your talk. <laughs> thank you. That's very interesting. So, a <laughs> simple-minded question, which is. Uh, for vile semi-metals where you know symmetry is not an issue is there anything you know is there anything any way that the topology manifests itself in real space um well there will be boundary states in vile semi-metals as well that's right but i mean about uh, you know this thing about Wanyi, uh, you know, uh, uh, right so okay, actually this so basically so if I, is there any place here that I have a little bit more space? Yeah, this is good. Um, so, so, right. So you can, you can kind of find what is the expectation value of the position with respect to one momentum, like the moment, one momentum direction. So what you do is like, if you have a Brillouin zone, okay, Y and KX, and you can ask, okay, I take all of these states and I ask where they are located in real space, okay? And then I, so, and then I swipe KY and I see if I can find a consistent position for all my states. So in a trivial insulator, in like an atomic insulator or atomic band, sorry, then what I'm going to find is that the expectation value, the position, it might just kind of change a little bit, but it's mostly in one place. So there's a consistent, you can choose a center for your your for your your Vanier states. Um, so if you have a topological band, you cannot consistent uh, choose it consistently because so if as you go from zero to two pi, you actually wind around. So that's a topological band. But now there's the other option, which is a valsima metal or graphene or something like that, where you have points like points in the in the in the in the Bruin zone where the gap is closed right so that means that the situation you have you have like a, a kink you you would have a point that would change things so so that changes which states are filled right so it changes the bands you are at so what you would see, the projection of these two spots, let's say that it's here and here. So these are near boundaries. And what I would find is that, okay, maybe I have this position here until I reach that, that vial point. And then I'm actually on this position. And then I reach that vial point again and I come back. So I don't have, an, a, a, also cannot associate a consistent position in general. So that's that's how would the the the, the, the Vania spectrum of a of a vial semimetal would look like or the Dirac semimetal. So it's in a, so in the same way it's also topological because the field states would not have a consistent position in orbital character. Thank you very much for your insights. Very <laughs> very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm good. Other questions? Okay, let's thank uh, Raquel uh, once more. And uh, if anybody um, would like to, to meet Raquel, uh, send me a message and uh, we can arrange a, a, a meeting, um, I guess uh, either later today or, or tomorrow because it's getting, it's getting late in Tel Aviv uh, currently. So thanks again, uh, Raquel. Thank you, thank you.